already know is that uh, we've been refunded for another four years, which is so, so exciting. Uh, our team itself, um, that one's a little bit of an older photo now. We've uh, had a little bit of turnover, but um, you can see that we've got a strong, dedicated workforce of around about 13 people on our team, uh, which we, uh, you know, a lot of them do the quit skills training, but we also have got a couple of other employees who go around quit line doing quit line enhancement. Uh, and then also we've got, uh, we're into the space of uh, cancer preventions as well. So uh, the team's building uh, and we feel also uh, from our other perspective as well, which is quite exciting, is that SA is actually going um, smoke free in prisons. And that's another project that the Quit Skills team will work through, which is quite exciting. Thanks. We have, we've grown, continued to grow. And uh, for a lot of you, I can see checking in there um, a lot of teams that we've worked with over the years. So well done to all of you because I think that uh, this national program has been so successful as a result of all of us working together. So this um, definitely has been a, a team effort over the years. So as Peter mentioned, for anyone that isn't aware, we are a national program. This is just some of the places that we've um, been to over the last six years. We've um, we started in 2012, so six years we've been travelling around Australia and we've had to, to modify a lot of our training around location where we've been. So you can imagine that conversations that we have with our clients and uh, things that are going on for them are very different if we're in remote Australia in comparison to maybe in the centre of a capital city. Um, that's got a, a lot to do with things such as funding, access to programs, access to uh, health centres, workers and possibly just due to national focus and um, infrastructure. So over the years we've developed a number of different streams to our training which has allowed us to help workers within the environment tailor this smoking conversation, talking to people about um, smoking cessation for their particular community. So that bit uh, has worked very well and we found that people have um, appreciated that we have kept on trying to improve, kept on trying to deliver different training and modified training according to location as well. I guess just following on from those locations, what, what is one of the most powerful tools that I've found in my three years here and Lou's been here for six is uh, uh, a lot of the communities right across Australia are very welcoming towards what we're trying to do and that's why it's such a positive. You go away, uh, you do the training and you make, you actually make some friends out of that as well and uh, the beauty of it is that, that, that any time they can always contact us for any follow-up support and we, we do often find sometimes that we go back to places uh, two or three times uh, because of staff turnover or if there's a little bit more they want to work on. Uh, that's the most powerful thing for us, I think, is, is, is actually being welcoming to all communities. So we actually love that. Uh, so going on to the next slide, what, was, what, what is Quit Skills training? So Quit Skills was pretty much brought about uh, for Aboriginal health workers, uh, designed back in 2012 with the aim to further uh, Aboriginal health workers or health workers, their knowledge, confidence uh, around smoking cessation skills, uh, particularly in the area of brief intervention. So as Lou said, we, we have a strong emphasis on brief interventions and how people go about that is up to them. Um, but we have in the past done some motiva motivational interviewing skills and we found also lately that uh, narrative therapy is another uh, great brief intervention. So that, they're the sort of things that we touch on. Uh, generally we provide assistance to anyone working towards a reduction of any smoking rates in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island communities. Um, so it's not just about Aboriginal health workers, we've also uh, train um, um, Aboriginal alcohol um, and other drugs, AOD workers. We've also done clinical staff. So you can see it's cross broad range. We try um, to adapt our trainings to, um, to, to the need of that community. So we might have some staff who are very strong around talking about clinical stuff, uh, but we also need to know that we need to meet cultural obligations of a, of a section as well or area. Uh, and that, by, that means that We've got a great mixture of Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal presenters, male and female, uh, and we always do our checks before we go, which is around cultural content and what are the sort of things we need to be wary of um, in regards to being uh, welcome to anyone's country. So very powerful stuff, uh, things that over a period of time 
we've learned well, um, you know, also ESL issues and um, having LNM um, behind us as well from, as trainers, we try and make um, the presentations easily understandable and that's around, um, you know, it could be around visuals, it could be around interpreters. So you can see straight away, because we've done so many courses, we've learnt this over time and I feel like we're getting a lot better around that. That's right. And we've trained um, nurses and doctors and CEOs of organisations and I guess um, we've opened up the doors to, to anyone because we believe that it also helps you guys on, you know, at, on the, the ground level to have um, your peers and management and anyone else working within your community to take smoking seriously as well. We believe that it supports your role and um, hopefully makes your job a bit easier if everyone has an understanding of um, what we're trying to tackle. So we currently have um, three different training options. As Peter mentioned, we did offer motivational interviewing a two-day training that uh, unfortunately hasn't been refunded. However, at the moment, what we can offer is um, the three-day quick skills training, which is basically the one that we've had on um, board since 2012. We've now got um, tackling Indigenous smoking for youth workers. So this is where we invite anyone that works with our young people to, uh, to come along and participate in, in the training and it's been tailored specifically for young people. Um, and we also have the quit smoking for our maternal health workers in remote communities. Both of those last two programs we piloted for the last 12 months and they were very successful and we were lucky enough to have um, funding reallocated by the government to support those again. So they're vastly different in regards to, um, to content only because we have three different sectors of people who, which we need to have different conversations with. So a lot of the statistics that we found was, was greatly different from quit skills. So we had worked out that it wasn't appropriate to be delivering um, a one smoking cessation training fits all model. So um, we've been really happy with the way that they've been received. We now run them both, um, the, both the additional trainings as three day trainings with everyone receiving the three competencies. So uh, we found that the community was a bit happy with that. You did some of the piloting for the youth training with me. What were some of the things that you found were um, most enjoyed by people? Uh, I, I think it's about um, having context in regards to working with youth. So having a youth background myself, it was, easy, it was pretty much easy to project a message because we're pretty much taking information from those youth workers and then taking that into context and how can we get those prevention messages out. So um, it was a pilot last year with the, with the youth workers and we've been refunded to do more youth work. And so now we're starting to work with those key st uh, stakeholders in regards to youth, which is like uh, Deadly Choices in Queensland. Uh, actually, they're expanding right across Australia. Uh, we've worked with the Department of Education and Child Development in South Australia. Uh, and then there's other opportunities like uh, the David Wirrapunda Foundation in Perth. Yep. So we're really targeting those um, those organisations and those caseworkers that work with our youth to try and um, you know um, get people not uptaking smoking. So uh, we feel like the youth sector is going pretty well. Um, the messages are getting out there um, because of laws and regulations. The kids aren't so much exposed. But the other thing that we're really conscious of though is that in remote areas, it's a little bit more difficult because um, you know with all the feedback we've had, it's about the kids, they, they uh, replicate what parents and, and role models are doing in those communities. There could be lack of opportunities and they may, there may be uh, no sporting programs. Uh, school can only do so much. So we try and educate these youth workers so that they can go away and feel comfortable about having conversations around smoking. So not just the cigarette smoking, but with Yandi and all that sort of stuff as well. So it's, it's been really, really important work and, and we're really um, looking forward because uh, Deadly Choices in Queensland want us to come up and train all their um, all their youth workers, and we've also got opportunities because we're making partnerships now with um, uh, with sporting um, entities like Port Adelaide Football Club um, Aboriginal programs. Uh, the Adelaide Crows are uh, launching a um, 
uh, an Aboriginal uh, academy for, for Aboriginal women um, to, to uptake that sport. So we're actually trying to tap into different markets now. So it's not just about people going on a quick journey. Let's talk about prevention messages as well. So that's why it's been so powerful. Right. And that looks a bit blurry to me, but that could be just because I don't uh, have my glasses on. But we can get all of those details with the competencies and what we address in each of those trainings. We can send out the flyer to anyone. Our email is at the end of this um, presentation. So please, if you want any further information, we can give that to you. And the um, maternal health workers has been very popular. It's it's a really difficult area. As most of you know that are um, have uh, been working in smoking cessation for a while. It's an area where we haven't seen much of a drop, whereas we've seen uh, a, a decrease in uh, smoking with our youth and across the board in general. Uh, with our, our pregnant mothers, we have not seen much change. So a lot of us have sort of come together to say we need to really keep this um, on the agenda, keep the focus. We've started working with a few major hospitals here in Adelaide and we hope to, to expand that out into other states as well where we can work with all maternal workers, um, any of the uh, Koori or um, Aboriginal um, maternal health programs as well, really trying to make sure that we get across um, to as many people as possible because this is a difficult one and no one has probably got um, uh, all of the answers at the moment, but it's something that we're really targeting, focused on, particularly for those pregnant mums in remote communities as well. Mm -hmm. And I guess just to further on that from Lou, um, you know, we, we've also found within our pilots that uh, a lot of their communities, they want the men involved as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've, we've sort of taken that on board and uh, we will send a male educator to go up and have those uh, group yarns with uh, with men in community because it is a holistic approach. Uh, obviously, the family, the household. Uh, we start talking to dads, you know, to say, hey, you know, um, these are the sort of things that's happening for your, you know, for your partner and your child. Um, what What are the sort of some of the things that you can do to support um, your your partner through this process? So we know that can be uh, it's very much environmental. Um, and from the last year, we did ten pilots around it and eight communities wanted us to come up and have a yarn with the men and, and that worked out really well. So we've got some fantastic shots and pics of these type of um, uh, trainings that we've, we've done in the, in the past and, uh, and definitely the next 12 months we are uh, another huge focus on um, smoking and maternal health. Yeah, so keep up the good work everybody. And well done, the youth, youth sector has been amazing to hear the stories from the teams that have just been dedicated to working with our young people. We, um, we've heard some fantastic stories and the statistics are definitely starting to show that um, we're not seeing quite the rise in um, uh, the smoking of young people as we have in the years past, so well done. Okay, so a bit of an outline of training. So some of you may have already been through quick skills, some of you haven't. These are the sort of things that we cover within the three days. So uh, obviously one, we've got tobacco in Australia, so we took a little bit about history, how it was introduced into Aboriginal Australia. Uh, we talk about legislation and regulations, um, obviously some health consequences, um, understanding smoking, um, you know, why people take it up, why they quit, um, ways they can go about it, processes of quitting. Uh, we talk about cessation methods and products, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, and then the key ones here are like working with your clients and having brief interventions. How do you have those conversations or how do you bring up those conversations, particularly with people who may not be ready to quit or some, some or, or, or we actually have, how do you have those conversations and keep working with them to keep the conversations going where they start to move towards change and that means that they won't go on a quick journey. Uh, we also, obviously a big part of our work is quick line as well and having those supports. So we talk about Quitline and other services. So we'll get Quitline to call in from each state. So depending, um, you know, what state or territory that we're um, uh, training in, we'll get a uh, representative from the Quitline. So perhaps Queensland Quitline if we're doing training in Cairns or Brisbane, and they'll come in and they'll they'll talk to you about what sort of um, options that they can provide from from their state or territory because everyone's run differently. Uh, and also we talk about legal and organisational policies and procedures. 
And then the big one now that we brought in um, towards the end, and it's all credit to um, to Lou here, who's our uh, program coordinator. She's uh, come up with some behavioural change plans, and this sort of you know you can have those conversations, but it's about recording as well and keeping uh, not only the worker accountable but also the client and. And it's about bringing it together and saying, you know what, here's an agreed value. What, what do we want to do with it? How often do we want to review it? So it doesn't really happen around too much, uh, doesn't happen very often, but we've found with these behaviour change plans, uh, a lot of the organisations that we've trained have now implemented these. Mm, yeah, that's right. It has been accepted very well. It's always a team effort. So thank you, <laughs> <laughs> um, Terrific. So, as you would know if you've ever done the quick skills training, and for those that uh, haven't, because we're training three competencies which virtually equate to a level four um, competency level, there is a, a considerable amount of work that's sort of involved over those three days. But uh, we tried to really um, keep on coming back and focusing on how do we make this um, varying in assessments, how do we make it interesting, engaging, a, a good mixture of case studies and role plays, which everybody hates. I don't think we've come across a training group yet that everyone says, you beauty, bring on those role plays. <laughs> um, the quizzes end, as Peter said, now this introduction of the behaviour change plan. So we can really start to consolidate the conversation and, and turn it into an action. Because after we did a, a round of um, refresher training, that was one of the things that the tobacco workers were saying to us. It was really good to be trained in the skills on how to have lovely conversations and talk about our smoking, but they didn't feel like there was sort of um, a full stop to that conversation. People just went off and it was up to them to, to instigate that next step. So the behaviour change plan just helps us bring it back so we've got something to focus on. And many of you probably even have something similar in your workplace if you're working to um, case notes with a client. So our assessment book, uh, people really like them. They always ask for them uh, to keep them because it's a good record as well of, of what they've been trained in and taken some of their notes. We do need everyone to come along to the three full days and commit. So we're always very grateful when, when people um, take the time out of their busy work schedule to do that. And um, we, we help people along, don't we? Our, our aim is to have everyone pass, but most importantly, our, our aim is to have everybody to understand what we're delivering. We don't want to just be voices out the front delivering theory and for it not to have, have that moment when people say, oh, yep, I get that. I understand that. I, I can see what they're, they're trying to get across. So that's probably most importantly our team's goal. So thank you. Okay, so with our, all of our trainings, they're all um, competency based. So our all spicing um, organisation is uh, Aboriginal Health Council of South Australia. Uh, and these are the units that you will uh, receive if you go through the full three days of training and pass all the requirements um, uh, being online. There's a little bit of online learning through Moodle at the start. And then we have three days in class. And then we get a couple of role plays happening at the end. So we've actually developed a couple uh, on iPads where people can work through it at their own pace. Uh, so the, by the time you've done your third day training, everyone's rocked up all days, finished all their components. These are the three units they will, they will receive. So uh, health population 0, 014, assess readiness for an effect behaviour change. Uh, and then there's POP 15, provide information on smoking and smoking cessation. And then POP 16, provide interventions to clients who are nicotine dependent. So that's, that's the benefit of coming into our trainings because they are competency based and it's really good for your PD as well to put onto your resumes uh, that you've actually done these um, units. But bearing in mind that if you did quick skills probably a few years back, there would be different um, units of competency. So these are the more up to date ones now. So if you have done it four or five years ago, we encourage you to, to uh, contact Do it us. Again. And then you'll get these new um, competencies as well, which will go onto your uh, your CV. And, and all we need from you is your USI number so that we can push it through. You'll do a registration form with AXA, and then they'll, um, they'll email you your certificate once it's all been approved. So um, so it's rec nationally recognised training, uh, and that's, that's the whole 
um, why it's been so successful because people want to make sure that it's not just a three day course and you get a certificate of attendance, it's actually worthwhile to, to try and get some qualifications at the end of it as well. And we make it nice and super friendly as well. We we'll try and get everyone through. Um, the only people that probably won't get their uh, competency is if they don't rock up on one or two days and that's very difficult for us to try and catch up. So that's why it's so important that if you do sign up, it's a full three days training and we need all the participants to be there all full three days. Uh, if they get through that, then they'll get all these units of competency. Excellent. So now we're just going to go and have a look at a bit of an overview from one of our um, staff members and, and our colleague Carolina Johnson. She's just going to explain how we have adapted a cultural model to uh, well, an existing smoking cessation competencies because these are part of um, a national framework. So she's just going to explain how uh, we've gone about doing that. We've put together an Aboriginal cultural model for our training, which is also being used on the, um, the Aboriginal quit line. To do this work in uh, Aboriginal communities, um, we look at um, a model whereby we take into consideration four areas. The first area being the history. We need to understand Aboriginal Australia history, the, the colonisation story and the effects on Aboriginal people today. We need to understand the introduction of tobacco into Aboriginal communities, so we need to understand that history. And we also need to understand and um, get some knowledge of the history of the whole tackling tobacco workforce, how long that's been in place. It's also important when you go to a new community, different community, to find out a little bit of history. The next part of the model is it being a holistic way of doing things. So we have to take into consideration the whole social and emotional well-being model framework of Aboriginal people. So within that we have the, um, the physical, the mental, the emotional, spiritual, cultural and the social politi political aspects of what's happening with the people you're working with. We cannot just work with someone about putting that cigarette in the bin. We have to take into consideration the whole context of their lives and the community and what it's going to mean for them to give up smoking. Third part of the model is those yarning tools. So for us to be able to do this work, we, we understand a bit about the history. We know we have to do look at a whole um, holistic approach. So we need some tools to be able to do this. One of those is um, narrative therapy. Um, another one is um, motivational interviewing. Then there's our quit skills training program that we provide. Also, different people bring other skills to, to this work. We also need to keep in mind what Aboriginal people's lived, lived experience is in this work because they have a lot of knowledge about um, living in community, um, what works and what doesn't work, and also in relation to um, supporting each other with the quitting. Uh, and the last one is how do we use all this knowledge and these skills and do the engagement with community and individuals in community. So if you do that through um, regular face-to-face -face contact on the phone or sitting down having a yarn under a tree or meeting with groups, meeting with individuals, however you do that, um, just take um, whatever you learn from the training we offer and um, put it all together using what fits best for you and your community. Excellent. Okay, we'll just switch back to Lou and Peter now. Just give us one second. Um, so I hope you could hear that okay. I hope that um, uh, that the sound and quality did um, what Carolina had to say justice because it, it was a very, um, uh, very important um, message within there generally. So Carolina is, has her Masters in Narrative Therapy so she's very much integral in guiding our team 
in regards to the delivery, conversations with clients, the resources we use and the training that has um, a narrative approach as well. So it is, we, we now see it as a fundamental part of our training too. Okay, so we'll move on to the next slide. So why are we addressing tobacco smoking within Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities? Well, smoking is obviously Australia's largest preventable cause of death and disease within our communities. At the moment, we're saying that research suggests that it's around about 39.8%, which is actually coming down. Um, probably give it 15, 20 years ago, we're probably around about the 55 to 60% mark. So you can see that all the test teams um, having a bit of a focus on tackling digital smoking, bringing down these rates. And obviously, quick skills is a big part of that, and that's trying to support local people, local communities on the ground to get these messages out and try to get our mob to stop smoking. So at the moment though, we do go to some communities, some very remote communities, and I'm sure if anyone's listening right now who live in those remote communities, those percentages can be quite different. They could be more towards 60, 70, 80% depending on where they are. And they tend to be the more remote, very remote areas where they tend to be a bit higher. Um, unfortunately, you know, we've traveled the country um, and you do see some sites, unfortunately, where we're getting young, young people, like six, seven-year-olds smoking. Um, so our, our goal is to try and get into these remote and very remote uh, communities and start getting this education process going uh, where we can actually start looking at this normalisation of smoking and breaking down those barriers. As you probably know, closing the gap, life expectancy, obviously, between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and, and obviously general population. It's around about 11.5 years for males and 9.7 years for females. So uh, smoking is a big component of that. Um, so addressing this, uh, giving as much support as possible, having that reliable person out there, doing those um, brief interventions is hopefully going to bring down those rates as we keep going. What, what is quite exciting is that there's not as much intake, uptake of smoking. So Probably in the last 10 years, there's been research around it say that we probably prevented about 160,000 Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people from uptaking smoking. And, that, and these are the sort of stats that keep us going, you know, that keep us wanting to make change and keeps us going out right across the country to, to deliver this training uh, so that communities can, can benefit from that. Education is power, as we all know, and the more we promote it, the more hopefully these rates will come down. Yep, excellent, thanks. So, as, as an integral part of our training, we always start off with a discussion around um, the, the history of tobacco in, in this country. So we're going to just show a little bit of a clip that sort of is used as part of a resource for our training, which explains the, the concept of the integration of tobacco and colonisation in this country, and it is um, an important message. There is the long history of Narali in Arnhem Land. That was long, long time ago. There was the first introduction was by a McKesson. Because they want to look around for Philip throughout Adam and Burton, but they want to say good. But I'm right now, I'm telling you. And then a lot of people, they might get to meet the German. The German, but I will not come to the German. Hey, no, I'm not from me. I'm not from me. I'm not from me. I'm not from me. I'm Smokes has been uh, become a part of a culture in a traditional things ceremony for one of the other moieties of Yerika Mayati in Eastern Arnhem Land. Like when we dance to get cigarette, we dance and then we get cigarette and then we sit around and smoke. 
skill. Like this happens when we have six women. The skill can do a very small, but I know that they're doing that dance and everything. But it's just uh, coming from all the way from Makassar. Like from us. And the military's uh, Second World War and uh, First World War that hangs here in Northern Australia. It's been a big impact to many of your people. The missionary, they might be putting on his track like I've seen them with blind up. They are like, man, I'll give them a going. Bing! Bing! Yeah, bing! I'll let you know when you're in the middle of the night. Really, and Russian was the wages. That's the wages for, for them. It's like a work. Truck. They used to work hard. Okay, and I'll just hand back over to Lou and Peter now, and they can finish off the presentation. Fantastic. Um, thanks for that, Millie. So that was one of the, the videos. There's also another one that we use uh, called A Clouded History, which is a bit more of an overview. But that's a, a very important um, resource as well that we use in our training. So I guess what we're trying to help all of the participants, particularly if they haven't worked within an Aboriginal community setting previously um, or don't have much of an understanding of, of how tobacco was introduced into this country, to, to allow people all at the same time to recognise that, that tobacco was introduced. It came as a part of colonisation and, and the effects that have been felt for the community right across Australia um, has been extremely significant. So it's not just a, a modern thing that everyone's just decided to start smoking. There's, there's a big history that um, that goes behind the statistics that we're seeing today. So we very much use a, a good part of that first morning talking about history and a lot of that cultural connection to, to tobacco that we see nowadays. Okay, so we'll just go to the next slide now. Um, and this is a big component of our training. And uh, we, we do actually have assessment around this and we talk, give it a, uh, a lot of group brainstorming as well. Uh, so I was talking about social determinants of health because uh, when we do talk about social determinants of health, a lot of Aboriginal people are affected by these sort of things that happen. So from a World Health Organisation perspective, um, you've got things like early life. Um, so you know what environment do you, do you are you born into? Uh, what community are you born into? So a lot of like um, Aboriginal people can be born into a lot of social economic areas. Um, then you talk about things like work, um, how important that is, you know, like, and that's about finances and so forth. You've got so social uh, exclusion as well. So that's not just so much uh, smokers in regards to uh, they're the ones who sort of sit outside and, and you know, sit together. There'll be other times where uh, people are actually being socially excluded because they're the only smokers in a workplace now. So we've seen a, a huge change around that. Uh, unemployment, I think that's pretty much self-explanatory. Uh, we go to a lot of communities to say, oh, okay, so uh, yes, we send kids through to year 12, but what's the pathway after that? Is there further um, educational opportunities or is there employment in this area? And most times out of 10, there's, there's not much really happening in that regard. So the unemployment factor comes into it, which is around finances. And then we talk about mental health. Uh, and then we talk about um, kinship and family and so forth, how that can affect that. Uh, we also talk about social support. Obviously, that's pretty important within Aboriginal communities. I know definitely for myself, I was a caseworker for many years. And uh, and to me, it was very eye-raising to hear uh, a lot of people just weren't even sure where to go to and get support. Uh, so sometimes it's about uh, workers working with um, particularly individuals. And, and putting them into the right direction. So, you know, social support is very, very important within all of our communities. Uh, we also talk about factors around food, um, just fresh food. Um, we know that uh, there's a lot of takeaway uh, opportunities right across the, the nation, and we know that it's cheaper than fresh fruit and veg and so forth. 
And I know we're also within remote communities, a lot of the remote communities don't even have a fridge or a freezer to keep it fresh. So there's sort of those sort of things that you have to work through, having access and obviously there's a lot of um, things that can happen as well around, particularly around addictions. If if someone's, you know, like a gambling addict, there's not really much money there for food. And, and it's the same exactly for buying cigarettes. We know that it's quite expensive now. So what do we weigh up? A packet of cigarettes, that's $45, or do we get bread, milk, um, you know, all the basics for, for your family. So there's those sort of things to weigh up as well. Uh, transport's another factor. So, you know, isolation. Uh, a lot of remote communities, they don't have an opportunity to get uh, chronic diseases and so forth to, to support them with their health. And we also know that uh, it can be quite expensive to get a licence or registration and then obviously uh, you know, factors like drink driving. So you, People are breaking the law and then they're actually having to get bigger fines or they actually might face some jail time around that. So that can be quite um, quite a huge factor. And then we talked about the social gradient. Um, you know, we've been to a lot of remote communities, particularly mining towns and so forth, and we see uh, a lot of homelessness and, and we know that smoking is very much high within um, those sort of areas of homelessness, um, unemployment, and, and that's where we find uh, like the higher sort of smoking rates to sort of get people through that. And I'll be very surprised if anyone here has never been stressed in their whole life. Uh, I think we've all faced stress, but there's different types of stresses. And, um, you know, we go out and we talk to communities and they'll, they'll tell us what those stresses are. Um, done, they've done some data um, and surveys around it to say what's, what's one of the biggest factors why people smoke in your community. And the biggest one that always comes back is stress. And, and that can be a range of things. That can be, you know, uh, your work life. It could be, a, you know, lack of finances or being able to manage your finances. Uh, it's about kinship. It could be about overcrowding in houses and so forth. So there's a lot of stresses happening for people on a day-to-day -day basis. And these are the sort of things where wider smoking rates are quite high in our Aboriginal communities. And I can probably go on for this for another two two hours or probably go for the whole day around social determinants. But for now, that, these are the sort of things that we need to put out to people. And that's the World Health, World Health Organization point of view, but you've got to also understand that there's other factors that um, affect Aboriginal people as well on top of that. So you can see people walk around with heavy shoulders uh, because they've got all these factors happening, but then there's also the cultural aspects of it as well. So, you know, things like racism, um, you know, uh, getting back to country, um, you know, uh, the big ones probably, and we all know, is grief and loss, you know. There's a lot of things happening for Aboriginal people and, you know, things like policies, you know, having the basics cards and interventions and that sort of thing. That, that weighs on top of our, on top of our mob and that, these are the sort of things that we need to understand that when you have someone come through your front door, it's not just about judgments of, well, someone's just having a smoke. We've actually got to sort of have a bit of empathy and understand where people are coming from. And that's what builds relationships with your clients and that's what keeps them coming back. Because we know with Aboriginal people, if you don't have that trust and rapport, then you won't be seeing them. So that's why it's so important to have an understanding about what's happening with social determinants within our communities and all the social issues as well. And we can we can talk about that for a very long time, but these are the sort of things that we uh, we actually um, we present uh, to groups. And, and the one more powerful thing is that we're not the experts. We come from Adelaide. We go into a community. We know that that community know their community. So when we do this, we tend to do a bit of a great uh, group brainstorm, and they're the ones who give us all the issues, what's happening there. And so it's quite powerful in that in that regard because they can actually see it and break it down and say, hang on, there are some issues around this. And I know that when we did, uh, we visit a uh, shepherd in Victoria, and while we we're there, they had this huge issue around ice. And and from that, they come up with a, a huge group forum. How are we going to tackle this ice epidemic? And so that's where you can see the power of community and and people who care about their community want to do things like that to make it nice and vibrant. Mm -hmm. No, that's right. Getting that um, the knowledge from the ground and having that space and time for a big group of people to come together and, and talk around it. Because even though we focus on smoking cessation, we know that it's never just about the cigarettes. There's all this other stuff and, and we do spend um, the majority of time threaded throughout the training talking about those other issues as well. Um, 
Another big part of the training, I guess, is going through and equipping everyone with the knowledge around NRT, which is our nicotine replacement therapy products. Um, what's available on um, under you know government programs, what's funded, what's not, and explaining to people how to use them. We find that this is certainly, even though it's um, it, it makes up a big part of the training, this is something we find people are really interested in. It's very rarely that we've come across someone that knows exactly how to use all of these things correctly. So we try and go through it, and even though we don't focus it on uh, promoting NRT as the only way that we believe people successfully can give up smoking. We do know from research that it definitely helps um, those quit rates. So we want to equip everyone with the knowledge around what is out there, how does it work, how does it help people, where can they find it and how much does it cost. So um, once again that is another big part of our, our smoking but we tail tailor that with the appropriate training as well because um, we'll go through when we talk about pregnancy, there's some of the stuff that we probably conservatively wouldn't recommend to, to pregnant mums as well. So the next thing that we um, look at here is uh, population health, which for anyone out there that's part of a, a Tackling Indigenous Smoking team, funded under the Closing the Gap, we know that with this last round of funding, there was a great deal of focus came out to talk about all teams being required to uh, work around population health. So we've now included into our training a section that um, goes through what is population health, uh, how does it affect uh, the community in general, what sort of programs are considered to be population health activities or population health promotion, um, what do they look like? And then we give a whole lot of examples of teams around Australia that are doing really effective population health promotion and how are they doing it. So we spend that time to actually help teams work out what they might do, what um, they could utilise because what we're, we're wanting to do is to get everyone on the same page and focus on that promotion of health and wellness opposed to that the, the disease prevention. We're also wanting to um, look at how we orientate specific groups or individuals towards change and how we can tailor specific needs to specific programs, which I think all you guys out there that I've seen working in a health promotion do really well, and addressing those social determinants of health. So ideally that's really the message a lot of us have been doing it, but we're just bringing that focus and awareness in to understand the reasons why we're doing it. So we actually take um, participants through that in the training as well. So this last slide that um, we're going to talk around, we'll probably spend a few minutes talking around this because this really is the, um, the thinking, I guess, behind a lot of our training. Did you want to have a chat about the youth in this particular diagram we've got here? Yeah, so uh, if you've done our trainings before, you would see that uh, we, we talk about these three aspects of smoking. So that you can see they all inter interlock with each other. So obviously when it comes to physical, that's the addiction to nicotine. Uh, and then you've also got other aspects why people, so obviously people smoke, they're addicted to nicotine, but then they have these other aspects as well around the, their behaviours and habits and also their emotions. So you'll find that people become, they, they form habits um, when they become smokers. So things like waking up first thing in the morning and having a coffee, or it might be around particular foods. So it might be after a meal uh, or particular foods they might eat. People, you know, if you're if you're basically hanging with the same sort of people who smoke as well, um, there may be some people that are not smokers. Um, but people, um, it's about you know when they when they get together, it might be in a place they might be going to a happy hour or something like that. They start drinking, you know, around alcohol, and then all of a sudden, yeah, that's when they start to smoke and so forth. And then there can be other stuff around um, drugs. Um, and, and their different behaviours. So you, you'll, you'll, you'll find that most smokers have a story and it becomes quite habitual. And we've heard some amazing stories over our period of time. They'll say, oh, look, you know, I, I, I don't know why, but I tend to spark, I, I, I tend to light up a cigarette when I get to a particular set of lights or something like that. So as you can see, you've got people, particularly people who have been smoking for a very long time, you know, they might have started when they're 12 and they, you know, might be in their 40s or 50s. So you can see, Every day, these are the sort of things that are happening for people. 
And so you get this other aspect too when it's around emotions. And we talked about that stress, you know, people turning to cigarettes to try and relieve out a little bit of stress for themselves or if they're excited. And the beauty, I guess, of nicotine is it can actually, you know, it can bring you up and uh, even if you're down, you know, and if, even if you're in a good mood, that's, that's the beauty of nicotine and that's why people get addicted to it. So when we're talking about these three aspects, it's, it's going to be very difficult for a user to give up, um, to give up or go on a quick journey if they haven't addressed those those things around it. habits and also emotions. And we tend to cause sometimes we, we call them triggers, and uh, and people actually do know what they are. So if you actually sit down a client, they'll actually sit there and they can actually do a diary and say, you know what, I, I tend to have a smoke in the morning straight away. So within five minutes, I need to have that cup of coffee, go to the toilet, and then I'm lighting up a cigarette. So it's about breaking down those, and then what are the, some some things, some strategies they can do instead of lighting up a cigarette. So that's what we try and break down, and that's what what can be quite powerful for health workers is, is is using those behavioural change uh, plans to sort of put these sort of um, things into place. Now that's just for a, like a, a generalised smoker who's trying yeah. to go on a quick quick journey. Yeah. Um, some of the youth trainings that we've been on it, it can look a little bit different. To, to this because you know they might not have these sort of habits around coffee and that. The youth might be, uh, well, you know, I don't really smoke at home because mum and dad are there, but what I do do is I'll go for, well, I meet up with my mates before school at the shop and that's when we have a smoke. Or after school, you know, or during lunch we might go for a smoke. So you can see it can be quite different. You can use this in different aspects and it's very much quite powerful because uh, you got to think of also when it comes around emotions like stress, you know, like, have a think about, like for a smoker, all they've ever known is to, when they get stressed, they have a cigarette. So it might be quite difficult for them to remember uh, back a long period of time as to what they did when they were stressed. And that's why we try and support them. And from there, it's not really about us as the counsellor or the support worker to tell them what to do. We have to draw that out from them. It's, it's got to be um, tailored towards that person because everyone goes on a, on a different journey. We can't put everyone in the same, same boat. Um, you've got to you've got to have those good um, counselling skills, and we talk about um, we talk about you know those different um, counselling type techniques around motivational interviewing and all skills and so forth to try and get people to draw out information about how they actually feel. So, um, and that can be the quite difficult thing because out of all the trainings that we do, they'll always say that the hardest thing is about. First thing would be is how do I start a conversation about smoking and how do I keep a conversation going about smoking, keeping them on track. It can be quite difficult and it's actually a bit of a skill and that's what we try and do in our training, support people and that's why we do those sort of role plays. So we can be there as coaches to sort of support them through that, that journey. So that's, that's pretty much the three aspects of smoking from a youth and a long-term addicted smoker. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, you want to touch yeah, on the pregnancy? Pregnancy, uh, we would address differently in the training because um, we have a duty of care to um, to the babies that our pregnant mums are carrying. So the conversation is probably tends to be one about really just addressing that um, physical addiction to the nicotine and trying to help our pregnant mums uh, get off uh, the smoking as quick as, as uh, they possibly can and to be. I guess well supported to do so. So from that um, that aspect, the training is a little bit different. But in general, the conversations are motivational. Um, motivational interviewing, we spend a lot of time working on, so people feel comfortable to be able to bring up smoking, as Peter said, with their clients, and to feel comfortable that it's okay to ask. We link that in with um, a lot of information about how nicotine actually plays an effect on a number of different areas. One of them is uh, its ability to work against other drugs that we're taking um, and to get us addicted to other drugs and alcohol much quicker than if we were a non-smoker. Uh, the effects of diabetes and, um, and the effects of mulling up as well. So we also link a lot of that, the, the information that we've heard from the community problems that they've faced where tobacco is not just seen in isolation either. So we spend a lot of time having the conversations, getting down to hearing that per person's story and in true sort of motivational interviewing spirit, 
just letting them know that we are there to, to help them work through that journey. But we've got a bit of a plan. So that's the important part. People want to feel supported as well. So um, that sort of really concludes all of that. I guess we're going to keep a couple of minutes in case anyone's got a question. We're full for this year. We're sort of doing three weeks, um, uh, three trainings a week at the moment till Christmas. But uh, in the new year, we are definitely um, open for, for business, certainly from uh, March onwards. So we would welcome anybody and everyone that uh, wants to talk to us further or would like us to come up and do a training or would like to be um, picked up if we have a training in your area. Yeah, and, and I guess the big bonus as well, it, it is free training. Uh, we're funded to go out and, and conduct free training to you, so, and we tend to come to you as well. Uh, all we ask from as a host organisation is to give us a venue that will probably fit up to 15 people, uh, have all the electronics and so forth, and maybe just a little bit of catering, you know, um, particularly around lunch. Um, we can do, we can support you with morning and afternoon tea. Uh, but yeah, just a, uh, some lunch would be fantastic. And our, our group numbers tend to be from uh, six to about 15. So um, yeah, so if you can get, round up some numbers, host host the, uh, the training, um, please talk to us, give us a call on the number provided or the email address uh, underneath and uh, we'll be more than happy to work with you as much as possible and uh, and who knows, we might be able to come back and form a partnership and and um, coming back to your area um, more, more often than once. So, and we do do that with some of the communities that are already. So uh, we love working in partnership. We're all in it for the same game and, um, you know, our passion is this and, and we can see the rates are coming down. And, uh, and I'm sure once uh, if you get yourself into a training, you'll, you'll enjoy it. We try and make it very much relaxed, uh, two-way conversations, no judgments made whatsoever um, because, uh, yeah, we do have smokers that come into our trainings as well and we make it very comfortable for them to say, you know what, if there's no judgments whatsoever from our end, we're here to give you some, some education and some tools so that you can go away and have those conversations with those clients. That's right. Excellent. Okay, thank you so much, Lou and Peter. That was that was great. I'd just like to open it up for questions. So we do have one um, quickly from Joe, who's just asked, "Is that service for um, just for South Australia?" Um, and someone else has replied to her and said, "No, it's national training." But that's the first question uh, we have. So is it, does anyone else have any other questions? You can just type them in the chat box. We'll get Lou and Peter to answer them. In the meantime, if you have any questions, our contact details are on the slide here. So there's the contact details for Lou and Peter, and then um, my contact details as well if you have any questions specifically related to the webinars. So we've just got a few people typing, and um, we'll just stay tuned for what they're asking. Thank you. Okay, so we've got a question. Any training happening in South East Queensland? South East Queensland. Is that I'll, I'll have a look while we do that. You, you would. Yeah, so um, obviously, yeah, we can. Um, we, we, we were in Brisbane not long ago and we've actually got a team in Cairns this week. Um, thinking about South East Queensland, uh, we've, we've done a f quite a few trainings with Toowoomba. Um, but what we can do is we can have a look and see if we can lock something in because if there's demand for training, yeah, so Brisbane, Gold Coast or Sunshine Coast, okay, yeah. So yeah, we have done some trainings uh, in Sunshine Coast not long ago, Brisbane only a few weeks ago with the Deadly Choices mob. Uh, Gold Coast is something that we really want to get on the radar because we haven't been there in a long time. Um, we're, we're looking at all, all parts of Australia, so basically it's just about um, you let us know if you can get those numbers together and then we'll book you into our calendar and then we can try and make something happen. Bearing in mind, if you can't fill a training, um, we if you can. can't fill a training uh, just from your organisation, we have also had trainings where we've recruited other staff in from, from that area. So there might be 
uh, from another NGO uh, health organisation. So we, we, we do try and make the numbers up. Um, so if you feel like, oh, I've only got four or five workers, we can we can tend to advertise it, put it onto our website, and then we can try and recruit other um, staff or, or anyone wanting to do the training um, and, and top those numbers up and then book you in. Excellent. Thanks, Pete. So we've just got another comment from Deb who, uh, not a question, just a comment. I love the slide on population health and public health. So there you go. Yeah, um, and <laughs> Do we have any other questions before we wrap up? I mean, if, if you do have any questions that you prefer just to send in an email, please feel free to do that as well. Um, yeah, absolutely. That's excellent. We, yep, we welcome anyone who's to write to us, even if you've got a few. We'll see what we can put together and um, and let's just get us committed to the next four years getting this message continued out there. Yep. So, excellent. Okay. Well, it doesn't look like we've got anyone typing, so maybe let's just wrap it up there. If you do have any questions or, like I said, any queries about the training, please feel free to get in touch with Lou and Peter, or any questions about the webinars, get in touch with me. Um, thanks for joining us, everyone. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you, everyone, for joining us and clocking in that a, um, a good hour, and um, we really appreciate you committing to the time. So we hope we've answered um, any of your questions if you came in again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Take care.